I'm going to tell you about a review paper that Janine Deacon and I published recently in Annual Reviews of Genomics and Human Genetics. It's all about taking a comparative genomics approach to understanding a transmissible cancer. So what I'm going to do first off is tell you about this amazing creature, the Tasmanian Devil. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the cancer and how it's affecting Tasmanian devils. I'll talk to you about the genomics of the tumour and also a bit about the immune response and why the immune system doesn't see the tumour as foreign. And I'll finish off by telling you about some of our strategies to save this species from extinction. The Tasmanian Devil is the world's largest remaining marsupial carnivore. It gained that title after we lost the thylacine back in the 1930s. Now devils will generally live for about five years in the wild and they'll breed at two, three and four years of age. They're marsupials which means they have a very short pregnancy. So pregnancy in devils is only about 18 days and the young are born at a very immature stage. The female will actually give birth to about 20 or 30 young, but she's only got four teats in her pouch. So the first four young to attach to the teats go on and develop. And they become mature or become independent at about nine months of age. This is Daisy. She's about five months old and she's being raised here at the Australian Reptile Park. She's part of the Save the Tasmanian Devil captive breeding program. The captive breeding program's been established because the devils face extinction in the wild due to a contagious cancer. Devil facial tumour disease is a contagious cancer and it's spread from animal to animal when they bite each other, which they do a lot during normal social interactions like feeding and mating. The tumour is characterised largely by large tumours on the face or the jaw and that's because that's where devils tend to bite each other but they can develop tumours elsewhere and in fact in 65% of cases the tumours metastasise throughout the body. So once we see a lesion usually the animals will die within six months either of starvation or from organ failure from the metastases. Now the disease was first seen in 1996 in the wild and it's already led to the loss of 85% of the species. And at this stage we predict extinction in the wild within 25 years. So devil facial tumour disease is a contagious cancer and we know this because of work that Anne-Marie Pierce and Kate Swift did. They looked at devil chromosomes and also tumour chromosomes and they found that the chromosomes in the tumour were really rearranged compared to the normal chromosomes. And what was really interesting was that the rearranged chromosomes were identical in every tumour. And this couldn't have happened independently in each devil. So instead, what we think's happened is that this rearrangement occurred once in one animal, and then the tumour has spread from animal to animal. So the DNA of the tumour actually tells us a lot about the origin of the cancer. We know that the tumour arose in a female, and the reason for that is that when we look at the sequence from the tumour, we can see that there are two copies of most of the chromosome X genes and there isn't any genetic material from the Y chromosome. The tumour also likely arose in a Schwann cell, which is a type of nerve cell. And the reason we know this is because the transcriptome of the tumour looks very much like a nerve transcriptome. In this paper, you'll read a really neat description of the chromosomes of DFTD. This is the area of research that my co-author Janine Deacon focuses on. Now, Janine's particularly interested in the gene order and arrangement of the genes in the DFTD genome. We had access to a, both a devil genome and a DFTD genome. But these genomes were sequenced using next generation sequencing, which meant that they were highly fragmented. So to look at gene order, Janine had to make cytogenetic maps of both the devil um, carrier type and of the DFTD carrier type. Janine used a really clever strategy to do this. What she did was she identified blocks of conserved genes between the opossum and the tamar wallaby. And these were the two marsupial genomes that we had access to. And then she mapped these blocks of genes onto the Tasmanian devil um, chromosomes. And in this way, she was able to determine the gene order of these genes in the Tasmanian devil. Once Janine determined gene order in normal chromosomes, she was able to map them onto tumour chromosomes. What you can see in this figure is a schematic of the chromosomes. So the top row are the normal chromosomes and they're nicely colour coded. So chromosome one is yellow, chromosome two is blue and so on. The first thing you should see is that chromosome 1 is missing and there are no sex chromosomes in DFTD cells. 
Instead, there are four marker chromosomes unique to the tumour that contain genetic material from chromosomes 1, 4, 5 and the X chromosome. So how could this rearrangement have occurred? Well, we think it was driven by an initial cataclysmic event called chromothripsis. During this process, fragments of chromosomes or entire chromosomes shattered and were then rejoined. We don't know why this process occurred, but we suspect it has something to do with shortening of the ends of chromosomes called telomeres. So after this initial chromothripsis event, the tumour has remained surprisingly stable, although we do see some minor strain variants and epigenetic changes in the cancer. There is a particularly interesting strain of the cancer on the Forestier Peninsula, which is a peninsula on the east coast of Tasmania. Now this site has been the site of a disease suppression trial. So essentially diseased animals have been culled in this area. And what's been really interesting is that during this process, instead of reducing the prevalence of the disease, instead human impacts have sped up the evolution of the cancer. And the cancer here appears to be more aggressive than in other parts of Tasmania. The reason I initially became interested in this disease was because on many levels it just doesn't make sense. How can you pass cells from one individual to another without there being immune recognition of these foreign cells? But that's exactly what happens. The devil's immune system doesn't see that the cancer is foreign. So initially, back in about 2007 now, we showed that devils are genetically very similar at immune genes called MHC genes. Now these are the genes that are matched between donors and recipients for organ transplantation. So we thought that in this case the devils were so genetically similar that the cancer cell wasn't seen by their immune system as foreign. But more recently skin graft trials have shown that devils are capable of rejecting skin grafts and this is driven by MHC differences. So we now think that the tumour has found a way to hide from the immune system. So the way we think this might be happening um, comes from insights from the only other known transmissible cancer out there. It's a canine transmissible venereal tumour. It's a sexually transmitted disease in dogs. And during growth of this tumour, the tumours actually downregulate cell surface MHC. But interestingly, this isn't a fatal disease in dogs. So during the regressive phase of the disease, the tumours upregulate MHC and then the dogs become immune for life. So the disease doesn't kill dogs. Um, could this happen in devils? Well, I think in the case of devils, we don't have enough devils out there for the tumour to evolve to become this really clever parasite. You know, in the case of dogs, there were plenty of dogs out there. Um, in devils, perhaps if we had an unlimited supply of devils, um, DFTD would also evolve to not kill its host. But I don't think it has time. Can we save the devil from extinction? We've got a lot of avenues we could take to try to save the species from extinction. And there is work in progress to try to develop a vaccine. But I do think that that's a long-term strategy. In the meantime, I think the captive breeding program is our best chance of saving the species. So as part of this captive breeding program, animals are being brought into zoos, like this one here at the Australian Reptile Park. They've been bred in free range enclosures like Devil Ark, and they're also being moved onto disease free islands. So with this program, we're moving devils away from the disease. And the plan is to capture and maintain all the genetic diversity that's out there in the wild now, and keep it safe in captivity for about 30 years. In 30 years time, we'll either have a vaccine developed or we'll have lost the species in the wild. And this population is going to be the population that repopulates the wild. Together with the Zoo and Aquarium Association, my team are managing the genetics of this insurance population. We hope that we can save this species from extinction so that future generations can experience this amazing animal in the wild.